Hi everyone, it's Elise from Kid and Cloud at Coloring Classes and I have a special present for you today. For Christmas in 2022, I'm gifting all of you a free coloring class on the Scrumptious Cupcake so we can learn all about coloring cake, icing, cherries, chocolate fudge sauce, while breaking down art fundamentals like light source, color theory, shading, and texture to help you grow your skills for when you color any image at all after class. If you are a card maker, this tutorial will be great for a birthday card, thank you, thinking of you, or any project at all, or it's just great practice to grow your skills for any image. I'll make this class available ongoing as well, so you can do it at any time, and it's free for absolutely everyone. So please feel free to share about this with anyone you know that like to learn more about coloring. In this lesson, I'll be teaching you both monikers and pencils separately, so you can use whatever medium you have in your stash. You can use any colors as well, as the colors here are just a guide and won't change your learning with the class. That's the same for all of the classes on my website. You don't need a full set to be able to join in, as it's not just a follow along, but I'm teaching you real art foundations and the why behind what we're doing, which applies to every blend. Now, if you're new to learning about art foundations and coloring, it's important to remember that a lot of the information in this class may be new, and that can feel overwhelming at times. Try to take any pressure or expectation off with learning today. It really doesn't matter what your finished project looks like, and as long as you've learned one new thing or improved upon one skill you already have, then you have grown. Learning requires practice and repetition. So it's okay not to master techniques the first time you try them, but we don't have to be great straight away at something to enjoy doing it and to have growth. So let's get ready to jump in here today. Now before we start, I'm going to give you a little crash course on an art fundamental called light source. This is really important whenever we do any sort of coloring as it informs where your shading will be placed on the page. Now, I usually work with ambient lighting, which is a major source of light in a scene like the sun, and these cast big cones of light over your entire image rather than coming from, say, one side. Now, the way that we approach adding shading with ambient light is we have to look at the image and determine what parts are popping out toward us. These raised parts will be hit by any light rays first and will make them appear lighter and brighter, and we call these our highlights. Now the opposite of this is the parts of the object that are curving or slanting away from the light. As these are further back, they're darker and are called shadows. Now between highlight and shadow we have midtone, and this is considered the true color of the object. We also have to consider cast shadow. A cast shadow is when an object in front or above casts a shadow on the object below or behind, and it helps to show distance between objects and levels. What I've just explained to you is probably the most important part of learning to color, but it doesn't sink in right away. I put this at the start of all of my videos because when you come to color a different image outside of class, I think it's really helpful for you just to go back to one of these classes and replay this amount of information. The more you look at breaking down the images, like we've just talked about light source and I'm gonna be breaking it down in just a moment for you even further, but the more we go over this, the more it sinks in and becomes a part of your process. And that's what's going to help you get the most depth and dimension in your projects going forward. Okay, so now that we've talked about light source and this basic, let's take a look at our image and think about how we can apply all of this theory to the coloring process. Before we get started today, I'm going to run us through some fundamental theories about the why with our coloring. So when you do a coloring class at Kid and Clouder, rather than just showing you how to color, I always teach you real art foundations that explain why we're doing what we're doing. And this is what you take away to apply to all different images after class as well. So I'm going to be chatting a bit through this chapter rather than coloring. I know it's easy to be a little bit impatient and want to skip ahead to just get started, but please really do watch this part of the tutorial because it's going to help you grow the most. And that's why you're here doing this lesson today, so we can improve our coloring and enhance our skills for the next time we jump in with an image. 
So we've already gone over light source. So when we look at this image here today, we want to think back on those light source theories and how we can incorporate them in our coloring. So we want to look at things like cast shadows. Do we have overlapping elements? And we can see there are quite a few actually when we start to break it down. So we've got, if we start from the top of the image, we've got the cherry here. Now, if we look at the outline of what's kind of happening, we can see that this sort of creamy frosting comes around but then it just sits over the top of the cherry. So the cherry is like concealed within our icing like this. So the icing is actually in front. So you can see here, I've come in with a nice dark pencil and applied a cast shadow onto the cherry. Remember, whatever's behind is always what has the shadow on it. And if you ever forget that, you can pop a pen or pencil over your hand and it's going to remind you that what's in front or above is casting that shadow back on the object below or behind. So we're breaking this down into the levels. We can then see if we come further down, we've got the chocolate sort of syrupy fudgy sauce. And the cream icing here actually comes around and sits on top of that fudgy sauce. So with my dark brown pencil, I added a nice dark shadow around that icing. As I come down to the pink icing here, that's below all of this fudgy sauce. So wherever we have that intersection, we're going to add a nice shadow around the fudgy sauce onto the pink icing below. The next layer is the cake and that's below both the fudgy sauce and the icing. But if we look at this, we can also see that the wrapper is coming up and over the cake as well. So the wrapper as well is going to have a bit of a cast shadow in there. So the cake's kind of the last layer for the back from everything else sort of going on. So that's breaking down the levels of our cupcake. Now from here, each individual object may have its own levels as well. So if I look at things like the icing, let's look at the pink icing for example. You can see it's sort of swirling back and forth on top of each other. And we know when we pipe icing, we start at the bottom and we come up and we're going around in that circular kind of shape to create the layers. So effectively, when we look at this, we want to look at the outlines of what's happening and determine what's in front and what's behind. And a good way I like to do that is just by tracing an outline. So we can start, say, with this section here we just grab this line we trace around it and see what's happening so we keep going until this point here and that's where we reach an intersection so my line just stops but we know that lines don't just stop in midair we have to think about what's happening behind the scenes so that would actually can continue back and sort of underneath what's happening here but we just can't see it so because our outline stops and we know everything else here would then be sitting above all of these extra layers would be casting a shadow back onto this section. So you can see I've used a darker color to come in and add it around to help it show that at that point, that part is further back. So we use the darker colors in and amongst the icing here to help really show the levels and the changes in the distance. So that one's a little bit swirly, a little trickier. So we'll break that down a little bit more as we come to that particular part of the video. It might be easier to understand the creamy icing at the top. So that's another object that has multiple layers. And if we come across like the outlines so of say we trace this, I can trace this part along. Nothing is intersecting with that line until we get to our fudgy source. But if I come to this next one below, I trace this around and I get to here and then we've got an intersection. That line has just stopped. But we know that what's happening, if we were to look like from above or a different angle, that line would extend back into the top, like where the cherry is. So this section here is behind the one to the right. So this one being in front. So you can see I've added a nice dark cast shadow onto the part that's below. And then I've continued down on each of those because they're kind of stepping down like this. So we're really breaking everything down and you can see that's what gives us the most, most depth and definition with our projects. So light source is very, very important. Now, another thing we want to think about here is we have texture, texture and the finish of each part of the image. We call this overarching thing materiality. 
So materiality is when you pick a finisher or an object and you break down every part of it. So we could pick something like, say, timber, and we think about all the different colors it comes in, all the different patterns it may come in. Uh, is it shiny? Is it matte? Is it opaque? Do we have reflection? Do we have a texture and bump along the surface or is it smooth? Uh, the different cuts that the timber can be and how that material may bend or move, how the light may impact it. We break down all of the different possibilities that we could have. And this is what we used to do. We used to literally would do that. We'd have timber and a whole page and you just write down all of those things. So you could have a study of it so that when you actually came to doing a design, you'd be able to go back to that page and look at the different ways it could be represented. With our coloring, it's essentially the same thing. We get to make the choice as to how we're going to approach coloring that particular object or material. So that's why it's really good to do something like a materiality test, because you can understand that rather than just doing the same colors all the time for the one thing, we can start to branch out and try and create more natural designs or coloring pieces by looking at the different ways that we can represent the materials. For example, if I'm looking at our cupcake, we know things like typically the cherries are really rich and dark and they have a really nice, shiny, reflective surface. Same with our fudgy sauce. It's usually quite shiny where the light hits. We've got the icing is usually really nice and smooth, not really patterned, not really textured, but really smooth. Cake, usually crumbly. We can usually see a lot of texture. So when we break down each of those things, it helps us understand how we're going to color them easier. When we work with shiny objects, the way that our eye sees shine is actually through contrast of color. We want to take our highlights basically to a white and contrast that against basically a black for the shadow. The difference in the colors helps our eye to read that as shine. And the way that we would think of this, remember we talked at the start of the video about highlight, midtone, and shadow. The highlight is the part that was raised up where the light was hitting. With shiny objects, it's a little bit different because as our light hits, it also reflects and bounces back. So if we think about it in terms of that, what happens is the light reflection is usually where we have a direction change on the object. So where you have like a corner or a curve or something like that happening rather than just in like the middle of the object. So you can see things like the cherry. I've got highlights on the sides where it would be curving out. On the icing, the same thing where we have all these bumps and ridges, those direction changes get hit by the light as well. So rather than just having one highlight, shiny objects will usually have multiple highlights to show where this light is hitting and bouncing back and creating these reflective surfaces. Whereas the matte objects like the icing here, these have very subtle highlights. We don't have as much contrast between light and shade. We're not really taking it down to necessarily a bright white or taking the shadow right down to a dark black. And the blend is just a bit smoother. It transitions softly into our highlight from our shadow. Our cake, even though we have texture here, we're still showing highlight, mid-tone and shadow. So you can see a nice dark cast shadow around the pink icing and around the wrapper. And then it's a bit lighter through the center area, even though we've got all of that color variation. So even when you work with texture, we always wanna be thinking about that light source and our cast shadow and how the object is impacted by this. Another cast shadow on the page that I haven't talked about yet is the one at the very bottom. So when we have like a tabletop or even like the ground, if an object is sitting on top of that, it's going to cast a shadow back onto that surface as well. Just like when you're walking outside, you cast a shadow onto the pavement. So we're imagining like our cake is sitting on maybe a kitchen counter and rather than drawing in the counter, I can portray this by creating the cast shadow from the cake that's sitting above the, um, the kitchen countertop. So the closer the shadow is to the object, the darker the shadow is. And remember the further out it gets, the softer and more dispersed it becomes. 
The last little thing to chat about here is our cupcake wrapper. And you can see that we can actually see a bit of the cake through the wrapper here. So we're working with a little bit of transparency as well. So when you're coloring uh, things like your cakes or when you're coloring anything at all really, you can always look up your objects on Google and see how these are actually photographed and shown in real life. Adding in little details like this is what makes your coloring look more realistic because a lot of the time people come in and just color the wrapper in any color they like, but we know in real life when we make cupcakes, you can usually see through the wrappers unless you've got real fancy wrappers that are really, really thick. And creating these little details can actually help the viewer connect with the topic a little more clearly. It's not necessarily harder to color by any means. It's a very simple technique, but taking the time to think through again, that materiality and how that object is represented in real life is what helps take your coloring to the next level. Now, I know hearing some of this theory behind what we're doing today can feel a little bit overwhelming, especially if you're new to coloring. Don't worry, it's totally okay to feel this way. I always like to think of it as like when you start a new job or say if you've ever studied before and you go in on day one and say you're going to study to be a doctor, go on day one, sit through one lecture and then they send you off into the world and go, okay, now you're a doctor. We all know that's not going to happen. It takes practice, it takes learning, and it takes time. So it's exactly the same with art. The problem we have is sometimes we associate coloring with being like a kid's activity. So we feel like it should be really easy, it should be really laid back, there aren't any foundations, but we don't understand why our coloring doesn't look like what other people are producing. It's their knowledge of the art foundations that helps it to look a little bit more advanced. And all these foundations and skills, you are absolutely capable and equipped to learn, but we just have to adjust our expectations just a little bit just to remember that this is still a proper skill set where we do have to learn and take away these sort of techniques to help us really grow and improve so remember today as you do your coloring it doesn't need to be perfect it's not why we're doing a lesson it doesn't need to be identical to mine or anyone else's that you see doing this lesson all that needs to happen today is that you learn one new thing or take away one skill that you already have and start refining it. That means that you're improving and growing every time you pick up your markers or pencils. So this is really important. And when we focus on the learning rather than whether something is right or wrong, we're able to stay a bit more neutral, which gives us more confidence and motivation to keep going. Your time is never wasted if you're growing and improving. So even if you don't love what you create here today, it's still a lesson and you're still taking away really great foundational tips to help you improve the next time you pick up your markers or pencils. And as always, if you feel stuck during any aspect of this tutorial, I always do free one-on-one -on -one private tutoring, tutoring with all of my class members, even if it's a free class. So you're welcome to get in touch personally via email or Facebook Messenger, not on the Facebook group, just so we can chat privately one-on-one -on -one, and we can work on some tips to help you feel more confident with your results. Never feel nervous doing this. I've actually been teaching our classes for over eight years now. And I've seen every type of coloring. I promise you that and I've made every mistake myself as well in the time that I've been doing this so it's never about judging how good you're doing or whether you've understood it's just about helping you achieve the results that you'd like to achieve and feel confident to keep going and I'd love for you to share your coloring in our Facebook community as well that's all about supporting each other with learning just like you're doing here today and cheering each other on we're not a competitive group it's not about who's doing well and who's not it's just about who's actually giving it a go and being proud of that okay so enough of me chatting I'm sure you're itching to get going with your coloring so let's go ahead and jump on in with this image I'm going to color in both markers and pencils separately so you can fast forward to whatever medium that you're going to be using here today I do recommend if you have markers and pencils try the tutorial in each medium I actually annotate in real time as I color so you'll get different tips in the markers versus the pencils tutorial as well, so that can really help you improve with more experience. Now 
Welcome to the pencils portion of the video tutorial. At the start of this video, I went through all the foundations behind the why with our coloring for what we're going to be doing here today. I know it's a little bit of chatting that you may have maybe hopefully not skipped past, but if you have, please, please go back and watch this. It's really important to understand the theory behind what we're doing today, because that's what's going to help you level up and grow and take away these skills for your next coloring project. Before we jump in with our pencils here today, I'm going to run through a basic blending video just to help you if you're new to coloring. Even if you've seen this before, I still recommend to watch again to help you with those basics before we come to our final project. And that way you can have a little bit of a play. I'll see you in a few moments where we'll start coloring our image. So when we color with our pencils, the first thing that I'm going to talk about is paper. So it's really important that we have a good drawing paper when we're coloring with the pencils. Drawing paper generally has what we call a tooth. So tooth is like a printed texture into the paper and that texture grips and holds the pigment. That's what allows you to layer and blend up so you're getting complex blends and allows you to keep the colors smooth. Now, the paper that I'm using here today is Mitont by Canson. There are many different brands that are available. We do have a big write-up on those on our website as well. You can head to kidandclatter.com, click FAQs, then coloring FAQs, and you'll see papers there. Now, the paper I'm using, if you're using the same one I am today, please make sure that you're using the right side. This is one of the only dual-sided papers on the market. So you may feel that your paper is dual sided because it's got a texture side and the other side smooth, but that's not actually dual sided. It's only just been printed on one side and the rest is just the standard paper. Whereas this one has two different textures. So the side I'm printing on is a little bit softer. The other side, the way you can tell is this side here. Notice it's got these little bumps all over there, like little circles. We call that the honeycomb print. Now that's for holding chalks and pastels and more heavy media like this. So we tend not to use the side. It takes a lot longer to blend out because the tooth is bigger to hold that different type of material. So I'm using the reverse side here. So if you are using the Miton paper, just make sure you've got it on that right side. If you're using a different drawing paper, you'll want that textured side so you can grip the pigment. Now, if you are using a smooth paper here today, that's okay. It's all practice and you're still going to be going over the techniques and it's still going to help you learn, but it's going to be a little harder to blend smooth. Your key here today is to go really slow and really soft as you build up the colors. That's going to help you gain a little bit more control. So no matter what paper you're using though, pencil work is all about going slow and soft with the blending. It's important to always keep your pencils nice and sharp. That gives you control and allows you to push the pigment down the page. And it's all about blending in really little soft layers. So we just build the pencil up over and over with multiple layers and strokes. And you can see the more layers I add, it grips into the paper and I'm slowly flattening that paper down. It's really important as you're blending though to be aware of the size of your strokes. If you're finding it hard to blend your paper smooth, if you're, if you're new to using paper with a tooth, it's probably because your strokes are too big at this point. So we want to make sure our strokes are only really small and I even like to use small circles to push the paper flat as I blend. Keeping that pencil sharp really does help with that as well. Now, instead of coming in with a hard texture and pressing it all flat straight away, the reason why we go soft is it allows us to build up those blends. So if I come in here nice and softly with one color, you can see I'm not placing any pressure down, but then I'm able to come back over with the next color and continue to blend out. Notice I've got no lines between my colors here. And then it's all about going back, building up the layers so you've got the control. Obviously we use a few more colors in this here today, but you can see the idea I'm slowly filling in the tooth, having control over my blend and getting those transitions nice and flat. Now what you may find when you're starting out with pencils, it's normal to be a little heavy handed. Now I'll just show you what happens if we're a little bit too heavy handed. 
If we come in here and we lay down our color, notice how my color is ending in a straight hard line there. Now as I come over to blend, what happens? You can see that line in between the colors. I haven't blended them smooth. That's because there was just too much pressure and I flattened down the tooth and the page too quickly. That means that there's no grip left for any more pigment, so I wasn't able to get that smooth. That's why we want to always focus on going nice and slow and soft so we do have that control over the duration of the blend. However, here's a little trick to help today. This is one that I have made up called fuzzing up the edge, technical term. So if you come in and you're a little heavy handed and you find you've got that line, it's not ruined. What I want you to do to focus on here is come back in really nice and slow and soft and come back over your edges here to fade them out. And I just go over the top to soften down. You can hold the pencil further back as well. That'll allow you to place less pressure on the pencil. And then once you've flattened that down, just make sure that the next color you come in with is nice and soft. And then you should be able to come back here, nice small little circles to blend. And you can see we're able to get those transitions smoother. So that's a good little tip to keep in mind today as you blend. Going back over, fuzzing up any edges that look a little bit too hard, but making sure overall that you're patient with your pencil coloring. It's about slow, soft layers for control. It's not a race to finish here today. Enjoy being in the moment to create that finished piece. Now one last thing before we jump in, one tool that I'm gonna be using here today that you're going to see is our Kid and Clatter Pencil Dusters. Now, every so often you're going to see me just wiping the page off like this, removing any of the dust that falls from my pencil. Now, the reason why this is important is if you're not constantly removing those little bits of pigment that are falling off, you can accidentally push them down into the page and smudge the pigment in. It'll give you a dirty look and you'll get little speckles all over your coloring. So you can use uh, many different things to do this. I used to use a feather because it was really soft, like a little emu or ostrich feather, and just brush away the pigment with this. The problem that I had with them is they kept breaking all over our page. So what I actually did when a lot of people requested what to use, I actually had these dusters made up for us. So I've actually picked the bristles that we use on these so they are super, super soft. They're softer than most of the art brushes and makeup brushes that are out there as well to make sure that you're not pushing the pigment down because you do have to be careful when you're brushing away that you're not using force, which is encouraging that pigment to grip into the tooth of the paper. But you can use whatever you have on hand, just be really gentle. Welcome back. We're going to go ahead and get started on this one. Now I'm going to start us off right at the top and we'll work our way down. I'm going to start with the cherry. So we're going to jump straight in with this one. We already talked about how the light source is going to work. A couple of other things I didn't mention at the start of the video is we have a little bit of reflective light here. So you'll notice on the very, very edges of the object, as the object is rounding right around to the very sides, our light reflects off that edge and that's what creates an additional highlight on these two edges. And then with the cherry, it comes up and then you get a little scoop in the middle and it comes up again before it rounds around. So our two highlights here are the two scoops in that central area. You'll notice as well, we have a little touch of highlight before the dip where our stem is. Again, a little bit of reflective light to show that level change. So popping this off to the side, I'm going to start with my Tuscan Red and I'm going to come along the outline of the cherry. Coming along the outline because our cherry curves away from the light, so the edges will always be darkest as it curves away. I'm going to add a little bit of shading in and next to the stem area as well because usually we have a little bit of a dip down there. Now I like to come back after I do my outline and I just really softly shade that out. So instead of having a hard line with my pencils, we want a softly shaded line, which is what's going to help it blend a little easier with the next color that we're going to be using. So just like we went through in that blending basics video, we want to avoid the hard lines always when we work with pencils. 
Don't forget we have a car shadow in and behind that frosting as well. So we're going to do a nice thick shadow, come in and then thicken that up. Your shadow will always suit the shape of the object as well. So you can see rather than going straight across, I'm doing all of the bumps and everything to show the shape of the icing that's in front. I'm going to add a little bit of shading up the side of the cherry here and we'll start creating that reflective light. Notice I'm leaving quite a big amount of white there. I want you to leave larger than you might expect because we can close that gap with our other colors. I'm going to come into the top bit a little there on the side just so we can show that sort of dip down in toward our stem area. And I'm also going to come up this other side too. Okay, next color is crimson red, and we're going to just pop straight over what we've just done and start to extend out toward our highlights a little more. At the top here where we have that stem, I'm going to draw around it so I can create that reflective light at that very edge. So we're using the light and the dark to show different levels of the cherry. Remember always blend out rather than just do lines. If you struggle with the pressure on the pencils, try to hold the pencil further back. This will stop you from placing very much pressure on the pencil as you work as well as you get used to this. It's very normal for people to be either too light handed, or too heavy handed when they start with pencils because the pencil control just takes a little bit of practice. So just be aware we are getting good coverage. We're working on the vibrancy of color. I can see little speckles showing through, which is the tooth and texture of my paper. It's not like super light though, so I'm not doing this where I can barely see through. That's going to take you all day to color. So we don't want to go this light where you're doing like 20 layers of color. We don't want to go this dark that you've got this hard line and it's really hard to blend out. So we just want to work like with a writing pressure. Good coverage, a little bit of tooth showing through and allow us to build up that color. You can see I'm starting to come through the center of the cherry now. That's where it looks kind of flat to our eye and it actually is scooping down a little between these two bulgy parts here, which is where we've got our extra highlights. And remember the cherry is shiny, so we want to aim to leave a little bit of white in my very highlight area. Carmine Red is next, straight over the top. And I'm really closing the gap on those highlights as well. Now through that last little area, I grab my white pencil and I'm just blending the edge of the red into the white of the paper. I'm not coming over all of the white. We want to actually leave that the same white of the paper so it appears brighter. But the white pencil just helps me to blend out that very edge. Now, that's one round of my blend. So you can see we've got shiny areas, we've got dark and light happening, we've got the levels, but it's still feeling a little flat. We don't have a super smooth blend and we have uh, the tooth of that paper showing through. So what we want to do now is we want to come back and repeat everything to build up a little more depth. To help me really create that shiny aspect, I'm even going to add a touch of black in my very shadow areas. Adding black to your blends, especially when you work on shiny objects, really increases the contrast between light and shade, which helps the object to look even shinier. So you can see I'm just coming around the base there and I might do a little at this very top area as well.
Tuscan red straight over the top and let's blend that out a little further. Crimson red start to come through that middle area. And then my Carmine Red. And I'm just going to use my white pencil to again help me flatten out toward that remaining white area. Now you can even use the white pencil to shape some of your highlights as well. So you can extend the white down into some of the area if you want it a little bolder. It's going to be totally up to you. We all color a little differently. So everyone's is going to need something a little different with that end treatment. Now, if you still have tooth showing, you can come back with your colors again and just use this to help you uh, flatten any remaining tooth on the page as well. So repeating is absolutely okay. And you may need more or less layers than me at the start because we always color a little differently as well. Everyone colors a little different. Then from here, I'm going to come into the stem and I've got my dark green pencil. I'm going to pop in along the very edge. Now I'm working with a small image here. So a little trick is you can come around the outer edge of the outline rather than inside the lines and no one's gonna be able to tell because your color is nice and dark. So that means it'll help you keep the interior of the stem nice and light if you've printed it small like I have. Then I like to come in and around that top bit and extend a little bit of color into the side there so we can show a different level change. Apple is next. And then just blending out. Try and leave a little smidge of white if you can, but you can see the stem, nice and easy to do. And that's our cherry all done. So let's continue down the page. I've now got burnt ochre and we're going to come into this creamy icing. Remember we talked about the different levels here and how they were stacked on top of each other. So we wanna add the burnt ochre straight underneath the part that's above. So I'm coming around each little section here Separating this into our layers. Now you can flesh this out with a few more strokes. I like to come around and create like our curves and that will start to fill in the icing a little bit as well and show rather than just being like flat, it's almost got like a little ripple through the icing.
Okay, so we've got two elements done already and you can see by using our light and shade we've created so much depth up here compared to just like the outlines. So let's continue using that technique as we go down the page. So I'm going to pop in now and let's do the fudgy icing. It's actually super simple, but what we want to do is we want to be aware of where those highlights are before we really do our coloring. So remember we talked about when we have our um, uh, shiny objects it's the direction changes when we want to have our highlights so on things like this here the way that i determine what's happening is actually by looking at the outline of the object so rather than this just being smooth you can see these little bumps along the edge of the outline so each of these little bumps is being created by something happening in the middle of the object otherwise the outline would just be smooth so we want to think about what might actually be happening. Now, whenever we have a curve in toward the middle, think of it as like being pulled in. That outline is being pulled and distorted. So whenever we have the pull in, I like to think of that as being like a little valley where it's pulled down. The parts that are popping away, I think of them like curving up like a little mountain. So that helps me with where I'm going to place my color. To make it easy, let's start on the fudgy sauce on the side. So with dark brown, I'm just gonna do a cast shadow around that pink icing first. So I just come the whole way around that. And then where I have those curves in, I'm going to add this darker color to show the valley. And then we'll leave the lighter areas here, lighter to show how they're popping out toward our light. I am going to come up the other side as well because the icing isn't flat, it is curving away from the light. So as it curves, it's curving around and getting darker. So I'm just shading that out as well. So we never want to leave things as just a line. Always create depth by blending out your lines, fuzzing up your edges, getting them softer. Extending on the other side here, I'm coming around and we'll do the same thing. We can add our darker color through the valley and then come up toward that little mountain. So we'll get lighter in toward that mountain area. Coming down now into that drip. Now the same thing, the drip is coming out, so I want that to be lighter so we can show sort of like the bulge that's usually on the end of the drip. So then I come in, you can see I close it off. I come up the sides of the length of the drip and I leave a little highlight through there as well. Again, shade it out. You can see we're starting to create that shiny effect by having that contrast between light and shade and by thinking about where the color is placed. Coming into the top area here now, and I'm going to do my little cast shadow beneath this sort of creamy icing. Now, you may find that your pencil starts to get blunt. If you find it hard to draw in your lines, it means you just need to give it a quick turn on your sharpener to make it a little easier. I'm going to do a bit of a highlight at this top area before the drips start. So you can see I kind of trace that around and I'm going to do another one over on this side as well. Come into the main area. leave a little bit of the white highlight up the length of the icing and then we can curve around now you can see a bit of a direction change here as we curve so because that's curving around and changing direction let's add a bit of a highlight through there so always at those direction changes you can trace along the edge of the icing as well so you can start to cap that off and then think about adding in your highlights through there as well Now we've got all these bumps extending through. So now is when we want, really want to be thinking about our highlights. I am going to use another color in with the icing as well. So you can make these bigger than you think they'll end up because we'll come back and close the gaps off. 
So don't worry if it looks or feels funny at this point, that's kind of normal. We'll make them less as we go along. As we come down to the length, we're going to have our highlight just curved sort of straight down. And then we've got that little drip on the side as well. So remember, once you've done the drip, bring the shading in a little bit again before your next highlight so that way you've got the drip is like sort of bulbing out and then it curves down and then we head back up into that length of the drip Almost done coming into this other side. I'm just separating through there, creating a little bit of highlight at that base. And even as you come up this other side, we can have a little highlight extending into that area as well. There's a little bit of pink in there, the pink icing. So we just want to be careful that we don't color over that by accident. Okay, the next color is a little bit of my burnt ochre. And with this color, we're just going to Continue blending out these highlights and that's just going to help it just gradually get lighter and have just a little bit more of that chocolatey sort of undertone as well. So we're still leaving actual white. That's important because that's what's giving us that shiny look in the icing here. And then as you come through all these smaller highlights, you can close them a little bit. So we'll just make them a little smaller. Now to finish up these areas, I just swap back to my white, make sure it's nice and sharp. And I like to come in the white area and then just over where the brown has ended. I start in the white as that'll keep it cleaner. And then I go back over the edges. If I were to go over the edges and then come into the white, there's a chance I could transfer some of that brown into that white area, which we wanna avoid. We just want to keep it really clean and vibrant to get our contrast of color.
if you press down a little harder you can increase the size of your highlights as well so if you feel like you've kind of lost them in areas you can make your highlights appear bigger by just doing a few more coats of color with the um, white pencil as well now if you still have tooth showing through i'd probably recommend at this stage to use your colorless blender pencil the blender pencil is a great pencil to help you get rid of the last remaining pieces of tooth it's the same core as the pencil you're using and that's why all different brands have different blenders um, and what it does is it essentially pushes around the pigment of the on, that's on your page now that's really important because it's not going to add pigment it's going to just push what's there so we want to make sure that our coloring is the right vibrancy that we ultimately want it because as we come in and apply it it's not going to add any more vibrancy it'll push what's around to fill in those little white speckles now if you've been really light-handed like this and we've got hardly any color on the page when i come in with the blender it's going to look and feel scratchy and all like sort of mottled and it's not going to give you a good blend so that's how you know that it's you really need more pigment so you do want to make sure that you've got it pretty much where you want it and it's just those last little bits that you're coming in and doing so I just grab the blender pencil at this point, make sure it's nice and sharp. And I just start in the shadows and then just go over any parts where I want that tooth to flatten down. So it just gets the last little bits. I don't use it all the time. It depends on what I'm coloring. Because you're pushing pigment around, it's not going to give you the smoothest blend. So we want to make sure that we're not using it on things maybe like skin or clothing where you really want that really nice blend happening. In that case, I would just be repeating the colors. But if we want a little bit of texture or it's a smaller element, we can absolutely come in and use the blender to speed things up. It just, it makes it quicker. It saves your pencils from being used as well because you're just using the blender rather than all the colors. It's good for background areas as well. So I do recommend to grab one if you don't yet have one in your stash. Okay, that's the chocolate done. Now coming into our pink icing. So we've got a little, little swirly whirlies here. And again, to make this stand out, the cast shadow is really important. So I'm grabbing my henna pencil and we can just start anywhere, but we want to basically add the henna to the parts that are behind. Now you can see there shapes like this, they look like they're curving back in on itself like that. And when this happens, if we have say a top lip, a top lip is always going to have a shadow straight underneath onto this part behind. So even though it's like one piece, one piece can still have its own cast shadows. So with this, I'm doing a cast shadow behind this little part, which is in front. And then I'm going to come up and under this little lip. So that's going to help this to look like this little bit on top is like this. It's the part that's curving back and we're adding color inside. So now we're even creating levels with just the one object. Now, the top lip itself may have a little bit of shadow as well because you may, instead of it just being flat, you may have like a little bit of an indent. So to show an indent, you just add a little bit of the darker color in the middle. So wherever we add the darkest color, we're basically showing level changes. We're showing that something's either dipping down, further back, or underneath. So that's what I'm thinking about as I come in and apply it to each of these little sections. Even here, we've got like this little curve down. If we add a little bit of shading straight through this curving down area, we can actually show that that's a dip rather than just being a flat surface. So even though you're not drawing the outline, you're in control of all of these little details with your coloring to create the interest and the realism and this is why like so many people say oh I can't draw I just can color but so many illustrators can't color and learn how to bring their work to life because they're totally different skill sets 
That's why if you ever look at Disney productions, Disney have a whole department just for coloring. They call it rendering. So it's, it's a real proper skill and that's why we have to go through all these foundational elements. And the more you do, the easier this gets and the more it sinks in. And this is why um, when we do our classes, so we do all different classes on the website, but the most popular class that I do is the monthly class. And the monthly class is really popular because that's going to help you grow the most because you're trying so many different new things. Every month I make a brand new class and we cycle between topics. So we might do flowers one month, we might do animals another, we might do characters another, we might do objects in another. So we're cycling through all of these different topics. And what happens is you end up trying things that you maybe have never colored or experienced before as well. And this is what helps you really grow and learn the most because it's pushing you outside of what's natural and comfortable. The more experience you get with things like this, the more it sinks in, the more it becomes second nature, and the more you'll be able to color anything with the skills you're learning. When we stick to just one topic or our favorite styles or companies, we tend to restrict our learning a little bit because we end up getting to a point where we're not subjecting ourselves to new shapes or textures or colors or anything like that. That's why even if you don't love fantasy, the fantasy ones are some of the most important because they will get you experimenting a lot more with the shape, the color, the texture and all that sort of thing. So always think about what you're learning in a class and taking away rather than thinking of it as being like a finished project. It's more of an exercise in helping you grow and expand. And the ones that you maybe don't love are probably the ones you're going to learn from the most. That's when I see people really grow. And it's amazing too, because I'll always see people say things like, oh, you know, that was a car this month and I don't really, like I don't have a need to color that. I don't really feel interested in cars as a subject. And I say, you know, just have a go because, you know, it's metal, it's tire, it's glass, it's uh, paint, it's all these different things that we don't usually get a chance to do. And then I often hear back from the person and they're like, I'm so glad that you pushed me to do that because it was my favorite lesson because it was so different and I was so impressed with my outcome from it. So that's why it's kind of like a book. You know how they have that never judge a book by its cover. It's the same thing. You don't know what you're actually going to enjoy doing until you actually have a go. And hopefully you're enjoying learning this one here today too. Food is always really fun because that too is a little bit different from what a lot of people are used to coloring. Now you'll notice when I'm doing some of the shading in the larger areas like this, I'm adding my shading and I'm leaving like the top uncolored. I've done that in a few of these. That's because I'm creating essentially a top lip, which I want to look like it's popping forward. So just like anywhere that we apply the darkest color to, it's going to look like it's further down. Anywhere that we leave white or the lightest color is going to look like it's popping up. swirl in here don't forget your car shadow in and around that chocolatey fudge too coming on the inside of this swirly shape all right next color is pink i'm going to pop in and apply straight over the shadow 
and extend a little further out. Now I want my pink to be quite light, so I'm not extending these colors too far. I'm leaving a lot of highlight space at this point. How far you extend each color is always going to impact how light or dark your blend ends up as well. For a lighter blend, we still use all the same colors, but we just pull back how much of each one we're using. For a darker blend, you might extend the colors a lot further out, leaving less room for a highlight. Next color is a little bit of deco pink. So really nice and light. I'm going over the previous and again, just extending out a short way as well, leaving a nice big highlight still, helping us to achieve the lighter blend and leaving space for me to do any flattening with my white pencil. And then grab the white pencil and apply through the remaining highlight area and just back and over where some of that pink has ended. You don't need to come the whole way back. I usually just take it back uh, to the mid-tone area, flatten down some of the tooth, lighten some of the highlight. You may find that your shadow is not as rich as you'd like at this point. I feel like another layer is really going to help me build up some more depth. Another way that you can build up the depth is with that pe blender pencil as well. So you can start in the shadow area and blend out towards your highlight. And then we can always come back and add a little more color over the blender too. Now you have to be careful with that because you won't be able to add a lot of color. Once your tooth is flattened, it won't hold a whole lot of pigment. But we can just like deepen up some of the shadows. So that's after the blender so I might grab a sharp henna back and you can see I can just pop in 
and really just define my shadow areas a second time. I'm not adding a lot of this color. I'm just sticking to my very, very shadows. We're getting there now. Just before I move on to the cake, let's do this little uh, candy cane popping out the top. Really simple. I will use the same blend as our cherry. And I'm going to grab a little bit of Tuscan Red and I'm just going to apply into the sides of this. Now, uh, on every second one, obviously. Now, this is adding to the sides helps to show that the object is rounded. The sides curving away from the light. So getting darker, the middle popping towards us, so being lighter, blending out with crimson red here, carmine red, I'm going to leave a pop of white through the center. Now in the white area, whenever we color white, we still want to add color because white objects are still affected by light and shade. So a good way to explain that is if you hold something over your paper, see how the shadow is still nice and dark. So I grab my 50% cool gray and I'm just popping into the sides there. And I've got a little bit of 30% and even a little bit of 10% just to help get the fade. Oops, I missed a little bit at the top. And then I'm going to blend in with my white. So blending over the edge of the color in each of these. Super simple, but you can see it makes it look more realistic. We're almost done. We just have the cake and the wrapper left to do. So let's pop in and create all of that cake texture. So I'm going to start with a little bit of dark brown. It's important we still have our car shadows showing. So I'm going to pop in car shadow around the icing because that is in front. Remember, if you're doing a line, you always want to blend it out too. Don't just leave it like a straight line. So you can trace like this and then we come back we flesh it out. Now the wrapper is sitting over the top of the cake, cake sort of back like this. So we want to add a shadow around these little wrapper parts as well. Make sure that your pencil is nice and sharp. And then I'm just tracing inside each of these. And then you can shade out from there. Now, as I do my shading out, you can see that's a really light. It's lighter than the lines I just did inside. So we want to create a little bit of texture with this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to work with the tooth of my paper. So I'm going to just really lightly brush along the surface of the tooth. So I'm just barely applying any pigment down. And I'm just doing it kind of rough and kind of messy. I'm not aiming to get good coverage. I'm just sort of splotching it on basically. Next color is going to be a little bit of Sienna Brown. And I'm just literally doing the same thing. I'm just kind of lightly splotching, kind of just like pushing the pencil down into the paper. And I'm not aiming for any smoothness to the blend. I'm just aiming to splotch that color down. A little bit of burnt ochre is next. And we'll just do the same thing, just splotch that color on. I'm just kind of like pushing that pencil into the paper. Because we're not focusing on getting a smooth blend, it should be leaving quite a bit of tooth. So as we do more layers of pigment, because some tooth won't get flattened, it will remain lighter and look like it's higher up. So we're basically encouraging the paper to have different levels of tooth. 
I'm going to make sure that I still go over my car shadows though. It's important that your car shadows are still noticeable, still strong, because they create your levels. Next color is goldenrod, and we're doing the same thing with this. Now remember how much or how little you use of each color will determine how dark the blend is. There's no right or wrong. Cakes come in all different colors and especially depending on cooking time, ingredients, etc. This is just one blend that you could potentially use. Next color is seashell pink. Now this color is pretty light and what I'm going to do here is I'm going to focus on dabbing this into the uncolored areas. So the areas that still look white at this point. So making like that white space stand out and you can even bring the white in and do a little with that too for a little bit of extra contrast so if you've got any tooth still showing focus on dabbing this where that tooth is now i'm going to grab my blender pencil and with this i'm just going to dab over the whole area same type of stroke, same dabbing motion. Now for a little bit more texture variation, I come all the way back to my dark brown. And now I'm just gonna do like little dots Make sure the pencil's sharp so you do have the control. If you've got tooth remaining, you can always focus your dots over the tooth as well. So you can do little tricks like this to further hide it. And I want you to do the same with the Sienna Brown. And this is how easy it is to create a cake texture. So we're playing around with how our strokes work, using the tooth of the paper to help us create even more dimension. And that's all there is to that. We're gonna leave the cake there, come down into the wrapper. Now I want the wrapper to be cake colored at the bottom, but lighter, because we're seeing it through the white of the wrapper. So I'm gonna add a little bit of shading around the base. And then I'm gonna come down the sides about mm, two thirds and then we can even come through and create the little scallop shape of where the wrapper sort of peels off from the cake so you can see I'm just doing like a little scallop around and then I'm going to come down each of these lines to create like that pleated effect. Now I'm coming down the left side of the ones facing the left. And then when I get to the middle, I'm going to change direction. The middle ones were going to be fairly central. And then as I bear off to the right, I'm coming along the right side of each of these lines. Now at the bottom of each of these shapes, I'm going to make it a little rounded. You can flesh some of this out with extra lines as well if you like, and extra depth.
Seashell pink is next. Come straight over all of the burnt ochre and then extend further out. Now, with this color step, what I'm gonna do is a technique called tinting. So tinting is when you use black or white to change the value of the color blend. So value is how light or dark the blend is. So for example, you know how you tint your car windows, you'd be tinting with black to make them darker. In this case, I want the blend to look lighter though. I want it to look like we're seeing the color of the cake through the white of the wrapper. So it's almost like the wrapper has some transparency. So once I lay all my color down like this, what I do is I tint it by coming straight over the top with the white pencil. So we do want color over most of the area. Leave a little bit of white before you hit the next crease line in the wrapper. So you can see I am extending the color fairly far, but not over all of the section. And then once you're happy with that, grab your sharp white, start in the remaining highlight, and then come back and over all of the color. Take your time and work in small circles so you can clean it up. Now remember when coloring white, we still wanna show the depth and detail. So I grab 70% cool gray and I'm just extending that crease line up into the wrapper area as well. So we're showing how the white part that's sort of separated from the cake still is impacted by light. Now at the very top, to create a bit of dimension where you sort of see the edge of the wrapper, I'm just going to do like that little scallop shape, but I'm coming sort of down from that top edge and leaving a little bit of white. Next color is my 50% cool gray, so extend up and then straight under that little scallop edge that I created. percent cool gray continue that blend same thing leave a bit of white though so we have a nice bright highlight area and then i finish with my white pencil I'm straight over the top of that color, leaving the remaining part of the highlight white. We're on the remaining stretch now. I just have the cast shadow to do from my cake underneath. So remember, the closer the shadow is to the object, the darker the shadow is. So I grab my 70% cool gray and I'm just coming straight underneath the object. Now, a shadow is always going to extend a little further out than the object as well because the object isn't sitting on the edge of the, the kitchen countertop. We actually have depth to it. So always with your shadows, extend back a little bit. And that's what helps it look a little bit more realistic and you want about the same angle and shape on the other side now i'm just doing a basic car shadow here and then as i get further out i'm just allowing my hand to soften a little bit so it just fades 
Grab your 50% cool gray and you're fading out on all sides. If you wanted to create like an actual tabletop, you would sort of create like a line here and you can make it more like the edge, but I just want it to look really soft. Like it's, we don't really have that hard line of shadow. It's just sitting right in the middle. 10% is next, 10% cool gray coming around all sides. And you can do this, of course, under any image, any character, florals, anything you like. It's called grounding the image. So you're basically showing it's not floating in the air. We do have, it's sitting on the surface of something. And it's always optional too. Like you don't have to add it. It doesn't mean that your coloring is not realistic if you don't have it, because it's often a stylistic choice whether or not you have it. They do this a lot in art where they don't want to have a shadow because they don't want to give it that presence. It's a bit um, lighter and more area without sometimes. And then your white, and I just come on the very edge of the gray and then extend into the white of the paper. And that just helps me get that fade. Now, if you have the tooth showing, you can of course repeat, or you can grab that blender pencil and just push some of that pigment out so it softens right down. All right, and that is our cupcake all colored up. So we've gone through a lot of theory just in this one lesson to help you take a simple image and make it a lot more dimensional and detailed. These techniques can apply to absolutely any image you color up as well. But remember, it takes time and practice for these techniques to really sink in and become part of our skill set. If you'd like to learn more with me, I have a lot of classes available in the shop on my website at kitandclouder.com. If you head to the homepage of the website, you'll even find free classes that you can try for markers and pencils, along with free color blend charts and a full comprehensive coloring FAQs page answering all of your coloring related questions. I always do free private tutoring one-on-one -on -one with my students as well, even with these free classes. So if you feel like you didn't get the results you'd like today or you have questions, please reach out by email or on private messenger and I'd be more than happy to help with extra tips on your coloring to help you feel more confident. Please also check out my Kit and Clouder Facebook community where everyone shares what they're working on to help support and boost each other up. I do free weekly art therapy posts, weekly giveaways and free stamps from other craft companies and a lot of coloring inspiration as well, along with our free weekly color blends. I'd love to see you share your cupcake with us and let me know what you thought of this lesson. Thank you so much for watching and hope to see you in the classrooms again. Welcome to the markers portion of the video tutorial. Now, if you haven't watched the start of this video where I'm chatting, please do go back and watch it because I'm going through all of those art fundamentals and theories that helps you understand the why behind what I'm doing here today. I know sometimes listening to theory can be a little less fun and we always just want to jump in with the coloring, but we're here today to learn and those foundations are really what help you level up that you take with you when you go to color your own images after class. So really, really important to hop back and take a quick look. Before we get started on the markers portion of the video, I am going to run you through a markers blending basics video as well to help you feel comfortable with some of the how to's before we jump into coloring this image. If you're brand new to coloring, I also recommend to check out my website, kiddingclouder.com, as I have a free class there called Markers 101, where I break down all of the basics for coloring with markers, all of the different strokes, light source, how to create color blends, how to do shading techniques. So this is a really great, totally free lesson that you can also use to help you feel comfortable with the basics. You don't need to do it before getting started here today because I will make sure to break everything down in this video, but it will help you with your coloring skills and feeling more confident. Okay, now with markers, I'm using my Copics here today. Now it's important when using alcohol markers that you use a good bleed proof cardstock. Now I'm using Expressive Blending Card. There are a few other types available as well, which you can find on the website, kiddingclouder.com. Click FAQs, then coloring FAQs, then you'll see the papers section with suggestions there. Now the reason why we use a bleed proof cardstock 
is it allows the ink to sit on the surface of the paper for longer rather than seeping through those fibers of the paper. This is what allows us to blend the colors together and allows us to work them a bit more. The reason why I like the Expressit is I find it tends to hold more layers of ink for longer, allowing the ink to sort of sit on the surface for a bit longer. Now, if you're brand new to using markers, what I would suggest, if you have difficulty with any of the strokes here today, that you pop onto our website, again, kiddingclatter.com, click Classrooms at the top of the page, and then scroll down to the free Markers 101 class. Now, this class runs through all of your marker fundamentals. Okay, so you can use any colors at all if you like, um, if you're going to color along with me. I'm just using my B12, 14, and 16. So a good blend to show highlight, midtone, and shadow. Now, when we do a coloring with our markers, the main stroke that we're going to use is feathering. So I don't really use circle blending in our classes, and that's because if you've learned circle blending before, what happens is if you've got your dark, middle, and light colors, and you're circling, you can actually muddy everything up. So when we work with light source, I tend to use more feathering method. Now feathering is when we come, we'll come parallel with the page. Now I'm holding the marker like I just would normal writing. So it's a little bit on its side rather than straight up and down. Now you may notice I'm holding the marker so it rests on my second last finger. A lot of people color with it on the last one. And when you color on the last one, what you'll notice here is I'm very close to the page. So as soon as I put my hand down, I'm sort of hitting the page already, whereas if I've got it on my second one here, when I come down to place the marker, I've got a bit more of a gap. My marker is sitting high from the page and I have a bit more control. Now, if you usually color like this, you may find that it just takes a little bit of practice to get comfortable in this one. You may find it doesn't work for you at all and that's okay, but I have had a lot of feedback that it's helped with fine lines. So have a practice today, see how you go, and maybe something that helps. So when we do the feathering, we're going to come parallel with the page and we lift our wrist at the end of the stroke and that gives me a nice fine finish to help with blending. I want to use the side of the marker so I get nice big broad coverage and you can see I'm overlapping so I get again that broad coverage there. I'm trying not to have much um, individual stroke like this showing at the end. So you can see here I've got pretty good coverage and just lifting as I finish up. Then I grab my next lightest color. So this is B14 for me. And I start just back of where I've ended with that color. And then I just do the same thing. So I feather straight over the top and extend further out. And I keep going until I can't see the line between the colors any further. Now I can see, however, the line of where I started this color. So once I've finished this, I just go back real quick. One layer should get rid of that line. So the idea with markers is that you keep blending until the lines disappear. And that's what your bleed proof cardstock helps with. So next color, B12, same thing. You just start back a little bit. Building up, remember, use the side of that marker. Nice, big, broad strokes. Keep going until that line disappears. When it does, if you can see where you started the color, just go back one nice stroke over the top until you're happy with the blend through. And that's all there is to it. So you want to make sure we're not getting these little stubby sort of strokes here. If you are, use a bit more of the side. And try and work quickly. I find when we work quickly and we're a little bit more carefree, it's a lot easier to blend with the markers. We're not as heavy handed. We don't need to think it through every little step so much to get a nice finish. Alright, welcome back. We're going to go ahead and jump on in on the image now. And I'm going to start from the top and we'll work our way down. So I'm going to start with our little cherry. Now remembering what we talked about with the light source at the start of the video, I'm going to start with R59 and we're going to apply to our shadow areas. So with this darker color, I'm going to trace along the line where that icing is sitting in front. So I'm making a nice cast shadow there. Your line work does not need to be super fine. A little bit of thickness is actually going to make it easier to blend out and give you a little bit more depth. There's a bit of a misconception that we always need super fine lines with markers, but we really don't. I'm now also going to pop up the side of the cherry, the side curving away from the light. 
so going to be a little darker. Now we do want that reflected light though, so at the very edges of the cherry as it rounds around, because we have such a strong direction change, we do pick up a little bit of reflected light. So you'll notice I'm coming up from the bottom and I'm doing a little bit of shading up to, to the side. So what I'm going to aim to do is I'm gonna have a little bit of white in here. So we're just shading toward that for now. I'm going to come along the stem and do like a little um, a little U shape there. And it's showing where the dip down is in the cherry where that stem is. And then come along the back and around to meet that. And then I'm just gonna do a little bit of shading at this bulge part here. And again, extend a bit of a line down so we can work on that reflected light. We'll do the same on the other side as well. Okay, next color in the blend is a little bit of R39. And I'm just going to pop in and we're going to go straight over what we've just done and then extend a little further out toward our highlight. I'm doing multiple strokes because it's all about layering up the alcohol on the page. We essentially blend with markers by laying down a darker color pigment and layering lighter pigment over the top. And we use the lighter pigment to dilute the darker pigment. So if you think of blending like diluting, it makes it a lot easier to understand. We're essentially just coming around and trying to soften what's already on the page. And that's why we do multiple layers, because the more layers, the more we're diluting the color down and we get rid of the lines between the colors. R29 is next and we're doing the same thing, just blending out. I'm going to start coloring up toward the center of the cherry and I'm going to do a U shape just before I meet that middle point. So that way we've got a little bit of reflected light over the center area as well. Coming into the sides, now remember we talked about having two highlights here so we could show the shine. So I'm just coming in toward those two highlights and also up this other side of the reflected light as well. R24 is next and we're just softening down. I just use this just to help the transition be nice and smooth. And to further help us blend out that red to the white, I'm going to grab R20. Now this color is nice and light, so I just dab it over where the reds are ending and that'll just soften it down to the remaining white in the page. Remember, we want contrast and color. So resist the urge to color over everything and even leave a little bit of white so we have a strong contrast between light and shade. Now, when you color with markers, uh, because we are diluting the color down, what happens is the darker color can become very diluted and we can lose a little bit of depth. To help us add more depth, we can repeat everything again. This is of course optional and we all color a little differently. So it'll depend on how you feel about the results at the moment. I'm feeling like my color is sitting pretty well, but I'm just going to show you what I would do anyway. So I just start with the R59 and I literally just come through and trace where I already laid this down. I repeat again for R29 and the colors will just look richer on the page. Now you'll notice I lost a little bit of the highlight there at the very top. So I'll show you how we get that back. There's a few little tips. You should always have a white gel pen and a white pencil in your stash if you are a marker colorist because they help with little details like this. I like to use a white Prismacolor pencil and for a gel pen, I usually use a Uniball Signo. And what we can do, I always like to use a white pencil first because a pencil will give you a softer touch. But I can just come straight over that highlight if I've lost it 
and notice how I can add it back in. Now it's not going to be as bright as if I just left the white, but it's a really good thing that you can add in if you accidentally lose it. And even through here, I can add a few little strokes to break that up and have a bit more control over the shape of my highlight as well. So you can do quite a bit with a white pencil and it help your coloring look a bit more realistic. But so simple, that's actually the cherry all done. Now don't worry if it feels a little bit funny at this point. It always looks funny when it's just one part of the image colored because we've got a little bit of color contrasting against all that white. So let's keep going. I'm going to work on the stem now and I grab my G28. Now, depending on how much experience you have or depend on how fine your line is here, it's okay if you just color over part of the stem like this. You can add a car shadow. Now, if you are more advanced, you can try coming down one side of the stem. And I like to just create like that little edge in there. Using your G24, we can fill in the rest of the stem area. Now, while I've got that red there, let's go ahead and do this little candy cane. I'm gonna have the middle to be lighter, like it's popping up toward us, but the side's darker as it curves around. So I'm gonna grab R59 and apply to the two sides of every second one and to any cast shadows. R39 is next and we're just blending in toward the center. R29. Now we are running out of a little bit of room, so I'm just making sure as I come in with R24 that I'm just using this over the very edge just to help me soften down. It's really important that I still leave white to get that shiny look. So I'm just going to pop in with R20 and it's just going over the edge, leaving that little bit of white. Now for the other stripes, I want them to look white. It's really important to remember that when coloring white, we still need to show that it's impacted by light and shade. A good example of this is if I hold something over my white piece of paper and you can see how dark that shadow is there, but my paper is still white that hasn't changed. So even though the actual object is nice and light, we really need to come in deep and dark with our shadows to show that it's affected by light and shade, to show that we have cast shadows and depth there. So I grab C3, I like to use my cool grays for my whites, and I just apply to the very shadow area. The trick is we leave our colors in the shadow areas and our highlights white, which will make them appear brighter still. And then I'm blending out with just a touch of C0 and that will help our color so light so it fades the gray down to the white of the paper. It always feels a little dark though because you are essentially adding color to white. So as soon as you add color, it's going to feel dark compared to the white of the paper. But when we add everything else, it sort of balances it out so it makes a little bit more visual sense as well. Coming into the creamy icing here. Now I'm going to use a light uh, beigey sort of blend. I'm going to start with E43. And remember at the start of the video, we talked about breaking this down into little sections. So with my E43, I'm just applying in all of my cast shadows on the sections that are behind. Now it doesn't need to be super duper fine. A little bit of thickness makes it easier to blend, remember? And once I've applied my cast shadows, I can go ahead and add some lines throughout the center of the bigger pieces as well. By keeping it light, you will indicate that it's all the same height. But if I add in some lines, I'm indicating a bit of movement, which is really nice for our icing. So I'm extending up just some lines from the top and bottom here just on the bigger ones. I'm gonna blend out with a little bit of E42. I'm just gonna pop in straight over the top, blend out some of this line work and some of your car shadows. So your car shadows should always get softer the further they are away as well. And then I'm gonna finish with a little touch of E41 and that will just fade my color out to the remaining white. 
So I'm not coloring over all of the surface. I am actually leaving little areas white. So I have a little bit of contrast variation and lightness. Let's pop in now to the chocolate fudgy sauce. So we're gonna get in there with a really nice dark brown. So we talked about when we have the little bumps in the surface here of the outline, we're going to use that as a place for our shadows. So when I start with the E49, I'm going to apply to the chocolate along the side. You can see I'm doing my car shadow first around the pink icing. Then where I have these little bumps in, I'm going to extend my lines straight across and create the shadow. I'm also going to come around the other side here. So you can see I'm leaving little bits of white, which are my shiny highlights on the parts that are popping out. You can see I've left bigger highlights than my finished result. And that's because I'm going to come in with another color and I'll use that to help me make the transition a little softer. So leave a bigger highlight than maybe you ultimately want. So we can add in just a little bit more variation. Now coming down now into the drip, at the bottom we've got like a little bulging part. I want that to have a nice highlight because it's popping forward. Then before we get into the drip, we will close that off. So we've got like a little dip down. So you can see I'm tracing over that bulgy part at the bottom. And then I'm coming into the middle where I've closed it off. And now I'm going to bring it into the sides. Now, we don't have a whole lot of space here, but a little trick is if you're losing room, you can actually come along the outside edge of the outline and no one will know because your color is nice and dark. So that's a little tip if you find that you're running out of room. Coming back into the center and I'm going to do a little car shadow underneath that icing there. And you can even create a bit of a highlight extending across. I'm tracing up the side. This little part here is going to be pink, so I'm just making sure I don't add color over that. But notice that my highlights are kind of following the shape. So you see how it's kind of rounded around? That's a really good explanation of how to create your highlights. They should always suit the shape of the object that you're coloring. So if you aren't sure how to draw the shape, just follow what's already there. You can see I'm creating my highlights where we've got these little bumps in the surface as well. Showing like the little drips as we extend down. All right, other side. Okay, so that's the fudgy sauce. Let's now grab E44 and all I'm doing with this it's just going over the edge of the E49 and just closing off some of those highlights. Now remember that one's pink, so don't color over that one. And I'm just making the highlight space a little smaller. I'm making sure that I still leave a considerable amount though. And I'm making sure that it, the actual highlight is going to be white. So just keep that in mind. So that will help you get your shiny look. It's the contrast between really bright white highlights and deep, dark, almost black shadows. That's 
how simple it is to do the chocolatey sauce too. And you can see adding in that white, it really makes it look shiny when you step back and you view at a little bit of a distance as well. Coming into my pinks now, I've got R85. And remember the key here is it's all about cast shadows. We've got all these little swirly bits. To create that, we want to think about adding in the cast shadows between the levels. So for this one here, for example, I can see that this whole section is sitting straight over the top. So this one's behind. So adding my shadow onto the part that's behind. Now I can see this little part here. It makes it look like I've got a curving lip. So even though it's one object, I'm kind of separating it into two to create the lip that's above. And whenever you have something above, remember it casts a shadow back. So straight underneath that lip, you'll have a shadow onto the rest of the surface. So we come in with the R85 and I'm applying straight under that lip there. And you can see now it makes it look like this part is within and that part being lighter is on top. So we can go ahead and create this. Now, when you've got a, a larger area for the lip, you can even add a little bit of shading just through the center. This will show that even on that top lip, we have a little bit of a dip in the middle. So wherever you place your darker color, you're essentially creating like a little crease or an area that's lower down. Wherever you have your lighter color, you're essentially creating a raised up area. And on this little part, for example, we can extend our darkest color through the middle. And now it's showing that dip lighter either side. So you really get to control so much when you understand how your color placement works. So if you want to create your own lip on any of these, you can draw in a little line and leave a gap between your line and the outline of the object. And that will create like a raised up lip along the edge. And the darker color will show where the direction changes and where it slants down. Coming in on the swirl, don't forget any car shadows from the fudgy sauce as well because it is in front. All right, once you've added in that color, we're going to blend out. So the next color is R83. I'm popping straight over the top and extending out just a little. Now, how far you extend each color is going to determine how dark your blend is. Now, there's no right or wrong way. Icing can be any color, any darkness. You can really play around with this. But as a general rule of thumb, the more you apply of your darker colors, the darker it's going to look overall. If you hold back and apply less and have more of your lighter colors, the blend will be lighter. So it just depends on what you're hoping to achieve. 
I wanting a more pastel, softer version. It's important that even when you want a softer version, that your shadows are still nice and rich. Otherwise, you won't have much contrast to show that light and shade. Our 81 is next, and again, I'm only extending out a short way. By extending a short way each time, it's going to make my highlight space bigger, which will mean the blend will appear lighter when I fade it out. And the next color is my RV00. And again, I'm blending out, but I'm not going to blend out over all of the shape. I'm going to aim to leave a little bit of white. This color is light enough that it should allow the pink to fade to the white seamlessly. This will make the blend even brighter again, helping it to look nice and soft. Now when I finish, sometimes I feel like with these sort of lighter blends, the darker shadows do lose that little bit of depth. So you can repeat with the R85 anywhere that you really want the shadows to stand out. So I usually will go over my car shadow areas or any parts where I want to make look it's significantly lower. Of course, we all color differently, so it's totally up to you if you feel it needs that. Sometimes if I feel like I don't have enough contrast, I'll even bump up to the next darkest color and just really do what I'm doing now. Just work the very shadows with that so I can make it even richer. In this case, going up to R89 is probably a bit too dark because it'll start getting into those sort of darker ready tones, but you could even try like maybe an E04. That could give you a nice sort of muted shadow as well to play with. But that is the icing all done. And you can see what looked quite complicated, hopefully a lot more simple than you were expecting. We are getting there now. We're really powering through. The next part we're going to color is the uh, cake. So we're going to pop in car shadow, very important as always. So we grab E37 and I'm just tracing straight underneath that pink icing to create my car shadow. Also want to come around the chocolatey fudge. Now our wrapper is sitting over the cake too. So the cake is kind of inside like this. So I'm going to trace around that wrapper edge to create a nice car shadow. And again, it doesn't need to be super, super fine. A little bit of thickness makes it easier to blend. Now from here, I want to dab. We're going to create a bit of texture. So rather than a smooth blend, I hold the marker like as if I was going to write, so a little bit on the side, and I'm kind of just dabbing through the area. I'm just allowing it to be a little bit messy. I'm trying not to really create lines, and it's more just a dabbing through the area. You can see I'm concentrating on dabbing where my shadows are and the middle is quite light, but I haven't left like everything in a straight row. The next color is E35 and we can just do the same thing. I just want you to dab, focus on the shadow areas and we're kind of just like mooshing those colors together. Spacing out your dabs is really important for the most natural look. Next color is a little bit of E33, same sort of thing, E31, again the same thing, we're getting closer to the center, and even as I come through the center, I just, I'm more sparse with my dabbing, so I'm not trying to get like full coverage. And then E31. Sorry, E30. So it's quite a simple technique, but you can see how effective it is just to add a bit more texture into the space. You can absolutely repeat anything you like. I've got my E31 here. Everyone's is going to be a little different depending on the size of your dabs, how much of each color you use as well. You can even come back with the E37 and even just kind of do like a few 
individual dabs to break up any areas that maybe don't have the texture as well. And you can do this technique with any color blend as well if you want to try a different color cake in the future. I even like to come over my car shadows again, the ends, so they're a little more defined. But super simple way to do your cake. Now on the wrap up, so remember at the bottom, I wanted it to show that it has that little bit of transparency. You can see a bit of the cake through that. So what I'm going to do is use the same blend, but I'm going to leave out all of those darker colors. That way I'm using the same color hue, so the same colorway, but it's not going to be as dark as where we can actually see the cake because we're seeing the cake through this white wrapper down here. So the color is going to be a little bit distorted, a little bit softer. I'm going to start with a little bit of E31. I'm going to apply into the bottom of the wrapper. Now I'm going to do like a scalloped edge. So at one point, like the wrapper will sort of come out from where the cake is. So what by doing the scalloped edge, we're sort of showing where the cake is sort of finishing inside before the wrapper just comes up and that you can't see the cake behind. So I'm going to come down each little crease. You can see on the ones that are facing the left, I'm coming along the left side. As we get to the middle, you can come across both sides. And then as we start to angle to the right, my strokes also are coming along the right side of each of these lines that the artist has drawn. At the bottom of each of these shapes, I like to dab and do a little circle. I'm just making sure they connect to the top. I'm gonna blend out with a little touch of E30. Now, if you can leave a little white, it will help to create a little more contrast and level change for you. And now we'll finish by coloring the top of the wrapper. Now, remember when we color white, we want to make sure that we still show how it's impacted by light and shade. So with this one, I'm going to grab my C3 and I'm going to extend that up toward the top. Now, as I get to the top area, I'm going to do a little scallop shape that's not touching the edge. And that's because I'm trying to show like the edge of the wrapper where you can kind of see over the top. So I'm just gonna follow that around actually. And you can see there's just a gap between what I'm doing and the very top of the wrapper. Then I'll come back and connect this in. Then using my C0, I'm going to pop straight over that line and underneath the scallop shape that I did at the top. And that'll just soften it right down. Almost done. We just have our car shadow left. So remember when you have something, uh, when you color an image, you can have the option of showing the groundings, the car shadow from the object itself onto a ground, a tabletop, whatever is happening in your background. It's absolutely optional. There's nothing wrong with ever just leaving it like that as well. Uh, there's no need to do a car shadow. It's a stylistic choice, whether you want it to look more grounded or whether you want sort of like that floating look. But all I do is I grab my C3 and you can make this however dark as you like. If you want it really dramatic, bump up your colors, go all the way up to C7 and maybe add some C5. But I'm just keeping it really soft. I just come straight underneath my cupcake and I'm really making this nice and thick. Now, whenever you do a car shadow, it's important to acknowledge that the object has depth, even though we don't see it. So even though this is flat in real life, think from the top, it, you can actually see like a bit of depth to it. So what we do is we come around the side of the cupcake and we create like that circular shape there to show that the shadow would extend back just like the object itself does as well. 
make sure it's nice and even and then you can blend out and I just have my C0 here and I just go straight over the top and you can see I'm just blending out but keeping that same circular shape. And that is our cupcake all colored up. So we've gone through a lot of theory just in this one lesson to help you take a simple image and make it a lot more dimensional and detailed. These techniques can apply to absolutely any image you color up as well. But remember, it takes time and practice for these techniques to really sink in and become part of our skill set. If you'd like to learn more with me, I have a lot of classes available in the shop on my website at kitandclouder.com. If you head to the homepage of the website, you'll even find free classes that you can try for markers and pencils, along with free color blend charts and a full comprehensive coloring FAQs page answering all of your coloring related questions. I always do free private tutoring one-on-one -on -one with my students as well, even with these free classes. So if you feel like you didn't get the results you'd like today or you have questions, please reach out by email or on private messenger and I'd be more than happy to help with extra tips on your coloring to help you feel more confident. Please also check out my Kit and Cloud of Facebook community where everyone shares what they're working on to help support and boost each other up. I do free weekly art therapy posts, weekly giveaways and free stamps from other craft companies and a lot of coloring inspiration as well along with our free weekly color blends. I'd love to see you share your cupcake with us and let me know what you thought of this lesson. Thank you so much for watching and hope to see you in the classrooms again.